Welcome back to Nutrapreneur, the platform for groundbreaking insights in the nutraceutical space. We're excited to welcome Margie Traxler, founder and CEO of Grain Free Mamas. Margie's journey, combining her scientific expertise with culinary artistry, led to the creation of Grain Free Mamas, a brand dedicated to healthy, delicious baking mixes free from gluten, grains, and sugar. Margie, thank you so much for joining us today to share your story and your insights. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So first, I think it would be great for you to take us through some of the initial challenges and your motivation behind starting Grain Free Mamas. Well, I'll start with the actual story of how I got started. So in 2004, my then six-year-old daughter, my youngest, um, just bent over screaming one night. So thought it was her appendix. We rushed to the emergency room and all the tests came back negative. And then they were like, well, we can take her appendix out. And I'm like, no, no, we'd like to keep her body parts. So we left really with zero answers other than that it, it wasn't her appendix. Well, my sister, who was uh, studying to be a natural nutritionist at the time, she goes, you know, it might be a combination of foods. And so I was like, okay, that was helpful. But I was like, well, how do I know? So we searched for you know, in America, um, I met American and Canadian. And in Canada, they have um, like physiopaths. So they have naturopath type people, but they have combination traditional natural medicine people. It's really hard to find that in the United States. So we found the best candidate for us. We lived in Las Vegas in Florida. And so we flew across the country to see this doctor in Florida and five minutes in his office you know, and he says, I'm going to tell you in the best little Florida accent I can, but he goes, well, when little anime eats wheat and sugar, it's making a toxic little punch and it's burning holes in her intestines. And I just remember at the time going, okay, well, that would explain screaming. And so having been raised with standard American, Southern, Northern European, North American diet, um, that my first, you know, she was like, thought her, you know, her eating life had ended at age six. And, and all I could think was, what am I going to feed my kid? What am I going to feed my kid? But, you know, as a mom, you're going to put on your best face. And so I was like, I don't worry about it. May we're going to go out, find the best looking gluten-free product that we can, and it'll be good. So we go to a big, well-known, you know, natural market that was right by the doctor's office. And we're walking down the aisles. And, and, you know, my first impression there was that the in that moment, the grocery store went from a friendly environment to a dangerous, hostile environment. So I'm walking down the aisles and I'm like, can't eat that, can't eat that, can't eat that, can't eat that. Because um, the edible grasses, which is the flowers of gluten and non-gluten grains, corn, rice, and cane sugar, are in everything. They're the cheap fillers that we put in products. And so our life turned upside down that day. So I found the best looking gluten-free product that we could. We went outside. I'm like, it's going to be good. It's so bad. You know, and we get outside the store. We stand toe to toe. We each get a thing. And I'm like, okay, one, two, three, take a bite. And the stuff, it explodes like sawdust in our mouths and her eyes start watering and her chin was quivering. And, and it birthed a passion in me. I stuck out my pinky finger and I said, Mommy's a scientist, anime, Pinky Promise. One day we will provide the products and the resources that we wish were available for us today. And so I was never looking to create a gluten free item. Like my products are not gluten free. They shouldn't be in the gluten free aisle. They should be right in the traditional aisle, right next to the stuff that's making everybody sick. And, and because that was gluten free is only part of the answer. And that's why people are just less sick. And in America, we've, We've accepted that actually all over the world, that less sick is acceptable. That's not acceptable. So that was never acceptable to me. Secondly, my kids are possibly some of the pickiest eaters on the planet. And so I'm like, okay. And so I studied cultures, countries, incidents of disease. And, and then from that, I picked out ingredients. And, um, and then what I ended up doing was I... My goal was twofold. Once I left that office, I was told that 
um, oh, well, you know, she could develop five to six autoimmune diseases before she dies. And, and, I, and I was like, not my fill in the blank children. And, uh, and also peer pressure works both ways. I'm like, we're not going to envy everybody else's food. They're going to envy ours. Mm -hmm. And so I left with that mindset and that left me open to research and create foods that could be eaten for a lifetime that were healthy, that didn't have the inflammatory responses that the baked goods do. And, and so that's what led me, you know, and my big, um, I had two aha moments, right? One was that first we went gluten-free and we were less sick, right? Then we went gluten grain-free, a little bit more less sick. And then we went gluten grain sugar-free. And I went, oh my gosh, uh, we're allergic to grass. 10 to 30% of the world's population is allergic to grass. And wow. yet our baked goods are based upon edible grass ingredients. And they're the fillers in all of our products. They're the fillers. I mean, here's, here's something that's really crazy. They're actually the non-active ingredient in a lot of allergy pills. Why would you put a grass ingredient in an allergy pill for grass, right? So there's so many conundrums and, and things that went in. And what I did was I used my scientific knowledge, my background to look at all the different things that people had discovered and put them together. And, and so that was the number one thing. Then the second big aha moment when got to starting the company was that, so I started experimenting and making different things. And then, and then all of a sudden my kids started asking for more and more food in their lunches. And I'm like, are you, are you guys really that hungry? And then my daughter pipes up and says, no, mommy, all my friends want to eat my food because their tummies feel better. And then I knew that I had hit on that. And that was really, those two things were the fuel that got me going. We went from edible grass-free, which was gluten grain, then sugar-free, cane sugar and corn sugar-free. Then we also went botanical nut-free because of the molds that are in nuts. And, you know, a lot of these new keto products that are out there, like we went nut free 15 years ago, way before, um, you know, also, you know, I was ahead of, I'm ahead of trend in a lot of things. Like, you know, people now are talking about butyrate's really good for the gut. Well, I formulated muffins and cookies for my kids, you know, 12 years ago that have resistant starch in them because I knew that butyrate would, would help to heal, you know, what had been happening. And so, you know, uh, but, but it was because my approach was different. I was never looking to create a product that was better. I was looking for a different way to make baked goods that could be safely consumed for a lifetime. Right. And you know, it is, it's, it's both fascinating and terrifying when you look at the labels and see what those ingredients really are. Like you said, there's a lot of fillers that people aren't aware of that could be contributing to a lot of the health issues that people are having. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, like if you read the ingredients on my labels, you would, anybody would recognize all of them. They're not written in scientific language. They're not written in the other stuff, but, but the things that I discovered, Bethany kind of led me on a trail. So first I produced, you know, I, I started with product, but I would always tell people, okay, it's product and education, but I was always working on the product side and then I was trying to push. But then all of a sudden during, especially during the pandemic, I went, okay, people need the education piece to understand the value of product. And also to understand that, you know, digestive distress is, is in a lot of settings, just, you just don't, it's not polite conversation. So people don't talk about it. And, and Americans think, well, I can eat the wheat in Europe and it's better. It's just American wheat. That's not true either. I have people during the pandemic, I had so many people calling me from, from um, Italy, from England, from, you know, all kinds of places because they just have different chemicals in their prod, in their things. So if you're an American, you go over and eat a gluten-free product in Europe, you don't have a toxicity level to those chemical ingredients. And so at first it seems like you can digest it better, but it's not true. You just haven't reached a toxic level yet. Yeah. And you said your background and your experience in the restaurant industry contribute to the unique approach of grain-free mamas. 
Yeah. So I was married for 22 years and we went from one to 15 restaurant lounges, right? So I'm very well versed. That vast ground in business has, is invaluable to me now building a different business. And, but also it showed me, you know, the behind the scenes of the restaurants and, and how, how hard it is for people that have food sensitivities and food allergies to eat in a restaurant because those little filler, like I actually, my true allergy is soy, believe it or not, which is really hard to get away from because soybean oil is the oil of choice in America. And uh, even though it was originally soy was considered the food for pigs because it wasn't fit for human consumption. But, um, but it was, it was, uh, you know, those kind of things made it hard, but it also gave me a leg up in creating product and and creating things that people can use. You know, the first we're first entering market with baking mixes, but then we'll go to, you know, uh, frozen shelf ready um, items too, because not everybody wants to bake at home. But it's the best entry level to get into it first. The gluten free space with shelf ready and frozen is is littered with products that are have a lot of false advertising on the front of the package. I could say. Yeah, and you know, I think education, like you said, is important. And so considering the increasing awareness about food sensitivities, what strategies have you implemented to educate and engage your customers? Well, okay. During the pandemic, I wrote a book. I had started it before the pandemic, but, um, but it's the actual food breakthrough, adjust your diet, transform your life book. And, and what I put in that book was I put myself back in 2004 and just tried to remember what what did I have to learn about basic nutrition to be able to make the changes? Because the thing that I think um, a good starting place for people to understand is that you can only make healthy choices that match the level of your nutrition knowledge. And so if you're trying to make healthy choices with a low nutrition knowledge, that leaves you prey to any marketing scheme. And that's where people go from this to this to this with no success. And so that I wrote the food breakthrough book. And then I just came out with the food breakthrough also cookbook, accompanying cookbook. Everything uh, can be made dairy free, edible grass ingredient free, uh, soy free, botanical nut free. Uh, you know, it's all in there. It's a lot of um, it's not sometimes you get into these specialty cookbooks and it, it, you have to buy all these weird ingredients to make them. And, and then it takes, like, they're so exotically beyond where the common man wants to eat, if you know what I mean. Like, they're, they're like five star. And everything in my book is quick and easy to make. It's simple. You can branch out from that and go as fancy as you want, but you can also eat it, make it simply and quickly. The other thing that came out of the pandemic, um, was the need for a community, a place that people can meet where they can learn together, where they can have a safe voice. Uh, the problem with social media is you can go into these groups on social media, but there's trolls. And these trolls, if you have people that are bashing you or basically calling you a liar for what you believe, that is so detrimental to your mental health and also your eating health. And so uh, created a place at the table because when you find out you can't safely eat, the standard American diet, you no longer have a place at the table. If you're going to go out to eat with your friends, they're like, oh, okay, where should we eat? Where should we eat? All eyes turn out, well, where can you eat? And it's such a statement where you feel like you don't fit in. And so that's what a place at the table was created. There's um, online classes in there. I'm just starting a new series, uh, a video series on how to go from taking a kitchen and a mindset that was, you know, steeped in standard American or Northern European or whatever diet and going to a healthy mindset. And so it's actually going to be a real hands-on virtual, you know, course. And then it will be on record for people that want to take that too. So the next piece that the final piece that kind of the biggest uh, education component came, you know, when you find out that you have uh, autoimmune disease or food sensitivities or food allergies even, um, you often like when you're out, they'll go, oh, let's go out to eat. And all eyes are on you. They're like, well, where can you eat? And 
you feel like you no longer have a place at the table. And it can be very lonely. Um, it can be very discouraging. And that's where a lot of people just choose to eat whatever at the expense of their health. No one wants to have to choose between good health and good food. And so the community is called A Place at the Table. Um, and it's a place where we come in and we peel back all the clever marketing and, and teach people and educate people and and show them, like, for example, with appeal, you know, here's the positive pros for appeal. Here's the cons for appeal. You know, here's the thing. You get to make your own choice. You know, you so it's education without bias. Right. And but also a place for people that they can communicate through, without trolls. You know, it's like a it's a polite environment. So if people are going to come in and want to be critics and stir up a lot of garbage, this is not the community for them. But if they want to come in and have a place where they can share what works for them, they can learn what works for other people, and they can pool that knowledge together and and be able to, you know, in the long run, I see this a place too. Like, you know, if grain-free mamas or good products are in a place, they can then all have a page where, hey, when you're out, when you're traveling, this is where you can find things. And and that's an opportunity too for people in the industry that want to let our community know, here's a safe place for you to eat. Here's a safe. So it's a place for the people that, it's a place where they can thrive and grow and feel belonging. And that's important because when you feel like, like you, you belong, you can take on tough challenges. You can change your assumptions that you were born, you know, that you were just saw growing up with food and, and instead turn over to a very healthy mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a fantastic resource. And even something that I'm going to be sharing with some family and friends that they have food sensitivities or allergies. And I I've seen them feel that way where they, they can't come to a restaurant because their child, they're worried about them getting sick or themselves. And, you know, it, it really excludes them from everything. And it's, it's sad to see. It is. It's isolating. And, and on there, there's like, <clears throat> there's a, a recipe section, there's isolation. One of the things that, you know, if you go into the community and look, you know, one of the members had posted, Hey, I saw this really good zucchini carrot muffin recipe, but you know, I was, you know, how would I make this grain free? And so I was able to take that, take that, and create a grain-free alternative that then I put that recipe in the community. So it's a place where people get answers to questions they have. They can get the help they need, you know? So, so yeah, it's, it's, I'm really excited about it. It's really a fun place. And uh, yeah, that is, has just barely launched. So I'm excited about that. You can get to that through our website too. So. Okay, great. Yeah, that's exciting. And, you know, moving on to kind of talking about innovations in healthy baking. So like you said, there's a lot of products that are out there that are gluten-free, um, you know, those traditional kind of options that are out there. But how does grain-free mamas stand out in terms of taste and health benefits? So they're not a gluten-free product. So I, I started out and I did have the gluten-free you know, like certification, then I thought that's so stupid. There's no option for them to have any gluten in them because that's a really stupid spend, right? So I I got rid of that. And so they're edible grass ingredient free. So there's absolutely zero gluten in them. So gluten free, you can have up to 20 parts per million gluten in a gluten free product, right? That'd be like this. Like if if I handed you a plate of brownies and and they, these brownies smell delicious. But then I lean over, I say to you, well, there's just a little tiny bit of dog poop in there. But you know what? It's less than 20 parts per million. You'll be fine. Are you going to eat them? No. But yet people consume gluten-free and then they go, oh, I've been cross-contaminated. No, you're contaminated by the food you're eating. So that's a big differentiation. Also, these are not edible gra Edible grasses act like traditional wheat products, right? So that taste and texture, but when you don't use wheat in them, what ends up happening is those products are inferior. Grain-Free Mama's products have the taste and texture. They're super moist. They, um, they're they light in the digestion, which is different, but a big differentiating factor is that they are, they have a satiation factor. So the edible grasses have an addiction factor. So you that's why when you eat pancakes, you're starving an hour and a half later. 
Grain Free Mama's products keep your blood sugar steady for a long time. So you eat smaller amount because you're satisfied, not because you're stuffed. So you stop eating because you're satisfied, which allows you to stop eating at with a reasonable amount of food, a much smaller amount of food. You're satisfied. And then your blood sugar stays steady. And so that satiation factor carries with you for hours. And so that's totally different than the gluten-free and traditionally made baked goods that are out there. This is a, a totally different way to make baked goods that I believe is going to revolutionize the way that we, li that we eat baked goods worldwide. This episode is brought to you by NutriPayments.com. If your business needs credit card processing that fully integrates with most major Nutra software platforms, offers the lowest industry prices, and has built-in features like recurring billing, $0 trials, and chargeback prevention, then visit us at NutriPayments.com for a free online quote. And you've already kind of shared with us your daughter's story and your personal family story, but could you also share with us just a success story where Grain Free Mama's products significantly impacted a customer's health or their lifestyle? Yes. Yeah, so Carla came to me and she was having, like she would get hives and her skin was itchy and just felt so bloated, always exhausted and tired. And, and she was like, you know, I kind of wonder if I should be gluten-free. And I was like, I think you have a full-blown grass allergy. Do you have seasonal allergies? She said, yes. I said, that's your problem. And people that have eczema and all that stuff, they put that cream on it. It never because all it's doing is it's not taking care of what's making it, you know, these magic pills that we have to help people. They're not helping. They're just taking away your ability to recognize the symptoms. And so what happened with her was she she started eating the crepes and the pizza. And she all of a sudden she was like, oh, my gosh. She goes now she goes, Margie, when I go into a restaurant, even if I'm not eating the wheat, if somebody brings out a biscuit and puts it right next to me, my skin starts itching and I'm not even the one eating it. Like she didn't realize how allergic she is. And isn't that the way grasses work? You don't have to be eating the grass. You just have to stand next to that grass and you get that allergic effect. And so for her, she just, her quality of life has skyrocketed. Um, you know, she's not having the hives, she's not having the eczema and, and she just, you know, and, and the thing is, it's a process. So for her, she would go back and eat it every now and then and get a little sicker and, and eat it and get sick. And, and that's one thing when I first went to that doctor with my, you know, with my daughter, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to make sure she never eats it? And he goes, oh, don't stop her. If she wants to eat something, just tell her, remind her of what happens when she eats, she's six, right? Just remind her of what happens she'll figure it out. And I was like, okay, not quite sure we're going to get there, but okay, I'll believe you. I'll try it. Sure enough, she had a chicken nugget after we got back from Florida one time. And then it was never worth it to her again because it was her choice. Mm -hmm. And so that's the big thing I think I would tell all people is that I could eat all the wheat and sugar and grains that I want to eat, but I just don't want to. It's not that I can't eat it. I just choose not to. Right. I think a lot of people don't really see it that way. And is it is it worth feeling that way all the time? Or would you rather eat something different and feel and sometimes it, it's worth it when you're going change it, making that changeover? At first it is worth it sometimes, but then after it's not. But in the moment it is. And and what happens is when we, you know, every pattern we have, whether it's an eating pattern, a thinking pattern, a walking pattern, talking pattern, whatever. These are well-worn paths. And so when we decide that path isn't good, we're still going to walk down it, but we're not going to walk as far before we go, not a good idea. And then not a good idea. And then finally, we're like, not a good idea. I'm going to go that way. you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's the break. And that's part of the thing in the community, the books, the products that I encourage people is that, you know, don't go to prison. I'm not a food, I'm not the food police. You know, let yourself go through this process and it will never be a struggle. Right. Exactly. And, you know, for your product line, what 
role does the ongoing research and development play in the evolution of new products that you come out with? Well, one of the rules hard and fast that I made with myself is that, is that this, um, a lot of the new products that are out there, they're, they're manipulating what occurs naturally. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're taking their isolates. Isolates are not a good idea, but so they're getting all these, they're pulling out the parts of things that the body recognizes as a whole, not as a part. And, and so I don't do that. I want to use the most natural ingredients in the most natural way and combine things without using um flavoring natural <laughs> yeah anyway flavoring natural flavors i like what i'm using to have its own flavors right mm -hmm. so i don't supplement i don't add extra things i don't fortify things i don't do that kind of stuff so when i'm looking at it i'm in a lot of ways, running contrary to the way that food science, I'm a natural food science, not um, a traditional food scientist. And so I want to combine things that like to be together. And what's happening with the foods that, you know, we see in the store traditionally and non-traditionally is they're forcing them, trying to hold them together with chemicals. And I, that is not how I believe it. So everything I'm doing is very innovative, ahead of market, ahead of trend. And, you know, I continue to do that. My newest uh, product that I have created that I'm going to be going to market with in 2024 is a roti bread. And it is delicious. And that, you know, there's no, it's not waxy. It's not, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, gluten-free, but they're waxy. They don't have it. You know, you eat them and you get this aftertaste in your mouth, like not for human consumption. And none of my products have that, you know, the taste, texture, and is all spot on. And so that's a very, very important part of what I'm doing. And, um, and so, uh, but they're also the cleanest products on the market, but they're cleaner than what the, you know, what a consumer could make for themselves. And, but they're all natural. And so that, you know, as far as like, if there's more, I can't really tell how I do it. <laughs> But, um, but the thing is, it's, you know, it's all super healthy because that's what I believe in. And, and here's the thing, and this is what I want to say to you. How long has nature been here before us? Yeah. I mean, regard, you know, depending on your beliefs, at least 7,000 years, if not billions, how long is it going to be here after we leave? So we have this little tiny lifespan and we think we know better than nature. I don't think so. We haven't been able to trick nature yet. These products that we've come out to in 10 years, they just, oh, they cause cancer. Well, of course they cause cancer because we're combining something good that occurs in nature with chemicals. That's never a good mix. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point. And, and really a philosophy that all brands should follow, um, but they don't currently. So it's great that you're doing that. And it sounds like the products are fantastic. They are. You should try them. You should love them. I just did a tasting for somebody the other day. And, and they're like, oh my gosh, I just tried nine things. And I, my stomach is so light. And I can't believe all the things I've tried. And I'm not, you know, it was, it was fun. And I was yeah. like, they, the products speak for themselves. Yeah. It's always exciting to get that good feedback about the products as well. Yes. Yes. And so I just have a lot of hope for it because I feel like um, when I go to the store, I'm like, people are being told to go grain free. Oh, you got to go grain free. Oh, you got to go sugar free. You hear this from the doctors, the doctors. And I had somebody go, well, how come you know more? And I'm like, well, a doctor studied, studied nutrition for six weeks. I've studied it for 30 years. Who do you think knows more? Right. I mean, believe who you want to. but. The thing is that I think it's only right that we have healthier options available and then let the customers choose. Right. But right now, that's not the case. We have clever marketing. You look at the front of the package and it promises all these things and you turn it around. And if you read both sides, which most people do not, it doesn't, it's not, it's, it's false. It's lying propaganda. And why is that? Okay, everything on the front of Grain Free Mamas matches up with what's on the back. And because I believe 
you know, in truth and honesty, that's the only way that we're going to make a dent. My goal, my vision for Grain Free Mamas is not just to slow down the incidence, but to help to reverse that trend and even eliminate it. You know, uh, type two diabetes is curable. Mm -hmm. And it's not curable with, with chemicals it's, and pharmaceuticals. It's curable by diet choices, lifestyle choices. And that's what people need to know. That's why the education is so important. Yes, it is. And, you know, it's good that we have passionate people like you out there that are able to educate consumers because even I'm, I'm learning so much from our conversation and it's just really interesting to hear your perspective. And I think your journey overall just really highlights the importance of food and overall health. And so how do you see grain-free mamas contributing to a healthier society? Well, I'm going to kind of throw a few statistics out because I think that'll help you to understand. So autoimmune disease, um, people that have autoimmune disease worldwide, the most current statistics say that, you know, approximately 4% of the world's population has at least one or more autoimmune disease. Okay. And I be- that's the people that have been diagnosed, that have gone in for a diagnosis. In America, we have 390 million people, 50 million people have been diagnosed. You and I both know a ton of people that are not diagnosed. So think about that, right? 50 million people, that is 14.7%. I think there's two to three times more people who are not diagnosed. But then if you go back to the statistics that I told you for allergies, allergies, seasonal allergies are, are affect 10 to 30% of the population worldwide. That is huge. We're talking billions of people. I think that's at least 2.5 billion people worldwide. And so if I can get an ear and talk to these people and, and this, I mean, you tell me how big of an impact is that? It's huge. It's a, an enormous, you know, population base. And I believe that is my life person. That was what I was put on this planet to do. Because somebody has to stand up and say, enough. Exactly. Yeah, and because it's out of control. Yeah, and the only way to affect that, because how do people vote? How do people affect change? Like they, they affect change with their pocketbook mm-hmm. by voting. And as long as these, these, um, Like, okay, so like in the store, there's always the gluten-free, sugar-free keto section. I call it the aisle of death. Like, I'm not going to put my products on the aisle of death. That's that's horrible tasting products. I'm like, no, put me in the traditional place where I'm never coming in the stores, right? And I'm actually a component of direct to consumer because I can offer the best price that way. I can give the people who need it the best taste. Autoimmune disease, food allergies does not know an income bracket. And yet, the good, healthy products are ultra premium for those same people. And it's wrong. So I believe good health is a right, not a privilege. And so, you know, in that, I'm like, you know, put me out there. Just give me a voice. You know, that I was so happy to come on. And I really appreciate you putting me on here because it's it's getting the, the information out there. If you are allergic to grasses. And you go in, in springtime, I'm going to go, hey, Bethany, go out in that field. You're going to go, right? (laughs) Go fetch that boat, right? But yet we're eating grasses three, four times a day. And then we wonder why allergies are so bad. I'm, I'm actually, I think I've reduced my seasonal allergies by 95% because I don't eat them. Yeah, that's incredible. So if you don't have them inside. Because the thing is, if you if you breathe them in and you get sinus infection and sinus inflammation, what are you getting when you eat them? Inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And you hear all the doctors today, oh, the problem that we have is inflammation. Well, the highest inflammatory foods are the edible grasses, pork, dairy, right? Those are high inflammatory foods. You just reduce those and so many people within six to eight months are going to turn their health markers around. Their body will just fix them. Yeah. But they have to know to be able to do it. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people just don't realize that, or they're just kind of listening to what their doctor says, which I'm not saying go against your doctor, 
but their doctors might not have all of that information. Like you said, six weeks in a nutrition class isn't going to give you all the information. Well, and I think too, like, you know, we, America is founded, we, we're one of the only nations in the world that does not have um, socialized medicine or, or Mm -hmm. so what that means, which I don't think the voters know what that means is health, good health is considered a privilege, not a right. But you go to all these other countries, health is a right, not a privilege. And so in America, the things that the FDA approves, all that kind of stuff, they're going from, they're going, these politicians are not evil. It's not some big conspiracy, but in order for them to stay in, in their political position, they need money. Well, the money is coming from the people who have the money and the people who have the money, those groups are not individuals wanting to be healthy. They're the pe- the pharmaceutical companies, they're the food, big food manufacturers, and they're not trying to have this, you know, the food manufacturers are not going, let's see how sick we can make people. But they're mo- because they're a company, companies cook differently than individuals do. But I founded my company cooking for individuals. My, my That's a big differentiation of Grain Free Mamas versus a lot of other food companies is I'm a people first company, a health first company. And, um, and so it's important that individual consumer who's consuming my products is my number one concern. Right. And, you know, until we have companies that stand up in that agreement that are going to get rid of, quote, I mean, if it's a natural flavor, why can't you say what it is? Seriously? Mm. Yeah. And the only reason you're calling it natural flavoring is if you put it on the package, people be like, I don't want to eat that. And so I'm just like, hey, label it. Just tell us what it is. Then people can make their own choice. But if people want to see healthier food in the shelves, they got to quit eat, They got to quit paying for the garbage. Absolutely. And, you know, I would say you're a leader in this industry. And so what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs in the health food sector? I think that people are becoming more and more aware of health because they have to. Incidents of disease in America, six out of 10 people in America have some kind of health crisis that is basically related to how they eat. So the um, the old, you can just get away with it. That's not there anymore. It's not. And the companies that that want to make it, that go with the old pattern of we're just going to do it for a profit, put the cheaper filler ingredients in there, they're going to be a flash in the pan. Because what you're finding now is that the truly healthy companies are starting to take hold. Mm -hmm. And as more of that happens, the bigger companies and the bigger grocery stores are going to have to pay attention to these healthier food companies. You know, it's taken me longer to get it going because I'm not willing to sell out. Right. And I don't believe that's in the best interest of me. If I was doing that, why would I even have a company with how I believe? It would be stupid, right? So for the entrepreneurs coming up, first off, don't just be looking to make a gluten-free product. Don't just be looking to make a keto product because the, even with the keto, the keto diet, you know, um, most Americans don't eat enough vegetables anyway. So the, when they eat high protein and high fat, they're, they're gonna, there's going to be all kinds of liver and kidney problems coming out. And so those are flash in the pan things. Everybody needs, it needs to go back to good health and good health the way it naturally occurs. Like, you know, grow the plants. We need bugs and dirt when we grow our fruits and vegetables. and you know, we need to keep that whole ecosystem alive. And, you know, there's, there's, we are not the center of the universe. We're part of the circle, you know? So I think for entrepreneurs coming up, stay, you know, know who you are in that place and, and create value, not just for now, but for decades. Yes. Great, great advice. And thank you once again for joining us today. This has been so educational and just, I loved hearing your story. And today's episode provided a fascinating look into the world of healthy baking and grain-free mama's revolutionary approach. Margie Traxler's story is a testament to innovation and dedication in this industry. 
So for more information about Grain Free Products, Grain Free Mamas and their products, check out the links that we provided. Remember to subscribe and share your thoughts on social media. Join us next time on Nutripreneur for more exciting discussions about the future of nutraceuticals. Stay informed and inspired.